<laughs> you can Pedro do it. Pedro welcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really excited and happy to be here. It's a an, an huge honor to share with amazing freedom and liberty fighters for all, all around the world. Um, because it's so inspiring for people that are fighting for freedom in countries like mine, like Venezuela. Um, and definitely, uh, I think that freedom fighters uh, have no borders. Um, and there are no physical or, or mental barriers between those who defend freedom every single day. And for that reason, I'm, I'm really honored and happy to be here with this amazing event, sharing with amazing people. And yes, let's talk about Venezuela. Um, when I was asked, uh, to prepare a speech and a presentation about Venezuela, what's going on, and what, what, what are we doing for freedom in my country. The first thing that came to my mind was, okay, where and how do I start? Because um, it's not easy. Because uh, no dimension that I try to describe our situation has a logical explanation for the suffering and, and the drama of Venezuelans except one at this moment. That is socialism, authoritarian, and criminal nature of the regime that we are facing right now. Um, and yes, it's a socialist, authoritarian, and criminal regime that today is usurping power in my country. Um, and of course, I have to say that the origin of that crisis, more than socialism, authoritarianism, and of course, the criminal nature, is the Chavismo. And when I, when I say Chavismo, I refer to the Hugo Chavez revolution that started 20, 20 years ago in 1998, and of course that Maduro followed after Chavez's death in 2013. But at the end, these 20 years, these 20 years of revolution, we call Chavismo. And that's important that you have this clear because we've been talking about this term during my presentation. So, uh, the first thing that I want to show you are some uh, you know, quick facts about my country today because it's important to show you what we are living right now as a country. There are some facts. Um, we are the world's least free economy at this moment. Okay? We are the most corrupt country in America. We have the highest inflation in the world. And I have to say here that more than the highest inflation is hyperinflation. And it's curious because of hyperinflation right now, um, normally when you, when you think in hyperinflation, you can imagine people carrying a lot of bills in a box, trying to go to supermarket with a lot of bills to pay or to buy something. But in our case, hyperinflation is a digital hyperinflation because there is shortage of bills. There's no paper for printing bills. So yes, the regime is printing digital money and injecting this money to the financial system, but it's virtual money at the end. So it's a, a digital hyperinflation. So yeah, a hyperinflation of the socialism of the 21st century at the end of the, of the day. Um, um, our country is the country that least respects the private property rights in the world in this moment. Um, 87% of the country is poor at this moment in Venezuela. Uh, nearly half of the population has lost 11 kilos on average during the last year of personal wave. Okay? Uh, nine out of 10 Venezuelans cannot afford their daily food. I refer to the three foods, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And hospitals have a medicine shortage around 88% at this moment. So these are economic and social facts, quick facts about the situation and what we are in this moment uh, as a consequence of, of socialism. But I also have to say that we are, you can see here Chavez and uh, his son Maduro, as he said in the past, um, Hugo Chavez revolution and, and of course Maduro following his legacy because Maduro says that he is following the legacy of Hugo Chavez. We need to understand that the violation of fundamental rights in my country, and when I say fundamental rights, I refer to, of course, property, life, 
and freedom, these fundamental rights, has been systematic, intentional, and a way to govern through fear. Because they understood that if they, if they you know, create fear in the people, they spread fear into the people, violating these rights, they could have control of the society. And in a certain way, they did it. So after that, in order to understand this, Venezuela is probably known for many things um, in the past and um, maybe right now. But yes, we are probably known because we have a lot of Miss Universe and beautiful women. We have a lot of titles, of beauty titles, you know. That's a, yeah, that's a fact. Um, because we have a beautiful and diverse landscapes. Of course, many of countries have a lot of landscapes, but of course, Venezuela are the best, and we always we will say that, of course. But um, it's normal to, to, yes, to say that, yes, we have beautiful landscapes. Um, yes, I have to include this in my presentation um, after, after, after talking with good friends from, from Mongolian friends. Um, and I have to say that I was pleasantly surprised about this serial movie that was showed in, in, in Mongolia in 1986, I think. Uh, I don't know if I'm right, but um, I'm, I'm surprised because this movie was a disaster and failure in my country. People didn't like uh, Karasusia. People hate, hate this, this, uh, this movie, but has been a success in Mongolia. And that been, has been really incredible to me because at the end, this movie show to the Mongolian people the capitalist way of life after you know, the collapse of socialism in this country. So it's really, really even more curious to me because uh, Venezuela today, which served as an inspiration to the Mongolian people through this movie, and of course, showing another vision of the world is a country that lives the direct consequences of socialism and misery in this moment, 20 years later. So it's crazy, but the, the main lesson that, that we need to learn on this is that bad ideas are always a possibility. It doesn't matter the time. And you can see how socialism never stops. And for that reason, freedom and liberty is an everyday task, everywhere, everywhere. If not, 20 years later, you can face a similar and terrible reality like Venezuela is living today. So it's crazy, but yes, it was a, a, a great, a great um, surprise to me about Karasusia, so that's good. But yes, we are known in Mongolia because Karasusia, that's good. Um, and of course, we are known because we have the largest amount of proven oil reserves in the world. 300,000 million barrels. So yes, of course, uh, you know, it could be supposed that it is a rich country for the simple fact of having countless natural resources. Um, I have to say that has been the great mistake that for years we have been led to believe for politicians to say that we are rich because we have infinite oil in my country. But curiously, even the country with the most oil in the world, like mine, suffers shortage of gasoline today. If you go to a gas station in my country right now, you can see how there are people doing lines for hours in order to get gasoline even having the largest reserve oil in the world. So that's a consequence of socialism, corruption, and of course, a model that, because of course, as in the Colombian case, the Venezuelan state is the owner of the subsoil, and that's a consequence of the redistribution of richness, but you can see how it works. So, but talking about Venezuela, Today, more than talking about beautiful women, um, Carasucia, and of course, these oil reserves. Um, speaking of Venezuela today is to speak of pain, misery, hunger, and death. And this is the normal 
um, picture that you can find in many homes in my country, poor homes, empty refrigerators. I have to repeat, yes, the largest oil reserves, but you can see this, okay? Um, the image of the rich country that distributed wealth, or its wealth, under the false illusion of prosperity because we have oil, is gone. And is become, or to become, to the country in which people and entire families, entire families, rummage through garbage for food. So yes, that country, the rich country with beautiful landscapes, you can find a lot of people, entire families, looking for food in the trash in this moment. Of course, only the regime was enriched and not satisfied with ruining the country after receiving, and please pay attention, more than $1 million for oil incomes during 10 years and robbing them, of course. Also, they have linked with international, or they have linked to international organized crime through mafias, drug trafficking, guerrillas, and my Colombian friends know about what I'm talking about, and terrorism, and of course, linked well with um, their colleagues of the Cuban, Russian, and Iranian regimes. So, as you can see, Venezuela's regime today is linked not only into socialism, authoritarianism, but in a criminal state. And that's that beautiful country that I showed you before is what Venezuela is today. Of course, with the largest humanitarian crisis in the region, with the largest migration in our history, and almost five million people that have left the country looking for opportunities through the border in Colombia, this is the main border in Colombia, between Venezuela and Colombia. With the highest hyperinflation in the world, um, this picture is, I think, two years ago where you could find bills, because you cannot find bills right now, but you can see how you need all these bills of 1,000 bolivars for buying only one kilo of tomato. That was two years ago in my country with hyperinflation. But yes, uh, last year the um, hyperinflation ends in 2 million percent and the projections for this year is 10 million percent, 10 million percent more than 10 million percent of hyperinflation by the end of this year. And of course, controls to the economy and to the uh, free exchange, we have, we have no, at the end, uh, uh, we don't have a free economy. With the most violent capital city in the world, with more than 400,000 killed people by the crime in the recent times, even more than in, like the conflict in Syria or in our war. Uh, with the expropriation and the violation of uh, private property permanently. With censorship on the internet and persecution of the press. And with more than 400 current political prisoners and more than 2,000 political prisoners in recent times, thousands of wounded and dead and thousands of persecuted and tortured, with violence by collectivos that are the armed groups by the regime that are, were created for defending revolution, Venezuela was turned into a hell. And that's Venezuela today. That is Venezuela today, a hell. But to understand Chavismo, I have to say that it's not an isolated project. And this is important to understand this. It's not an isolated project. It's not only about Hugo Chavez and yes, I'm socialist and I want to transform the country with a revolution. No, no, no. To understand Chavismo, we must understand a much more ambitious project that Fidel Castro's Cuba and the former president of Brazil, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, perfected after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And it's called the Foro de Sao Paulo, the Sao Paulo Forum. I don't know if you have, have heard about this initiative, but this was the plan of the continental leftists in Latin America to take the power of the region through democratic ways. In resume, 
they use democracy for destroying democracies. And I have to say that they were successful. In 2009, in 2009, 10 years ago, we did high has peak for in, in their plan of destroying and, and of course to take power in Latin America. They had 14 governments, left its government in Latin America. And of course, the result of that, socialism, corruption, and regression. That was the 21st century uh, socialism. And of course, I have a bad news for you. They are a permanent threat. Um, my Colombian friends know about that. I, in Argentina, my Argentinian friends know that right now because they are facing the same challenges. So yes, it was a huge project, a huge regional, a huge regional project that took power of Latin America. But, well, you can see the usual suspects here, of course, of, in Latin America in the best moment of the photo of Sao Paulo. You can see Evo Morales from Bolivia, Celaya from Honduras, Ortega from Nicaragua, Chavez from Venezuela, and Correa for, from Ecuador, the big club of friends of socialism in Latin America. But Venezuela was a socialist country since much earlier. It's not only about Chavez, and it's important to describe this. Because before Chavez came to power, Venezuela uh, lived through four democratic decades, perhaps the most democratic of its, of, in its history, with full political freedom, but with economic freedom not warranted. And that was a big, big state, because, mainly because the oil state that was in charge of seizing all the spaces and monopolized the economy and the economic activity, they released privilege to the productive sectors in my country, and the result is that all the society became dependent of the big oil state, and they destroyed the economy. So, as I say, uh, we went from a veggie socialism during these 40 years of democracy, a vegetarian socialism, yeah. Yeah, to a carnivorous one with Chavez during the last 20 years. But at the end, it's the same way to depredate economies and countries. It doesn't matter if it's vegetarian or carnivorous. It's, it's socialist, and it's socialist is always socialism, so they want to destroy. So I was eight years old when Hugo Chavez came to power. Uh, now I am 28. Um, my generation has had to pay immense cost and make enormous sacrifices because it has been the young people like me who have suffered the most the consequence of this regime. Um, most of the murdered people are, were young in the streets during the protests. And of course, the majority of people that are fleeing through the borders right now in my country are young people. And of course, a lot of people, even here, good friends, ask me, uh, what, may, what made me stay in Venezuela fighting after this situation? So it's, it's normal. My friends everywhere told me, uh, tell me about that and ask me about that. So what make a stay you, what made you stay and fight in your country, even at the risk of being persecuted, even at the risk of being in jail, even at the risk of being killed? Because I know that being here in Mongolia is a risk to me when I come back. At the end, my answer is the love, the love for my country. I love Venezuela. Um, more than that, the understanding that that doing politics right now in my country is an act of legitimate defense. It's an act of legitimate defense against a criminal power that usurps power in my country. So it is the best way I found to not give the country to those who hate it. And um, yes, my decision was Never, never surrender. So that's the main reason because I'm stay and remain in my country fighting. And of course, that decision broke me. Uh, that decision broke others with me, because to stay alone in my country with all my friends from childhood, school, or university, I think in my country only remain two or three of them 
all my friends have left the country. Of course, without my family who decided to emigrate. And I remember that day, um, I remember that we were in the living room at home and my family were sitting in the living room and they told me like, okay, we decided to emigrate. Um, we want you that emigrate with us. Uh, you need to, to, to live with us. And my answer was not. I will remain and I want to be here fighting. Of course, they disagree. They say that I'm you know, investing my best years of life in an insane reality like the socialism 21st century, etc., etc. But at the end, my conviction was to fight and I decided to stay. And yes, alone. And of course, that, that they are not with me is the best peace of mind that I have to keep fighting without anything happening to them. Because I'm alone in the country and I, and, and, and I know that I could, I could do things that if they were in the country, it's impossible to me to do. But at the same time, I know that I'm missing enduring moments together that I know that will not be repeated. And that's a sacrifice that, I'll, as me, a lot of people have done in my country. So I have to say that this, that, that this is another success of socialism. Divide families, divide societies, and of course, to promote resentment um, breaking societies. And, and that, was, uh, that is one of our, our main challenges when transition comes, because we need to reunite all these people and put together again. So for all these reasons, is that seven years ago, we decided to create Vente Venezuela. Uh, it's the first and unique liberal party that exists in Venezuela. We believe that it was time to finally defend freedom in every sense through capitalism, free economy, open markets, free trade, individual freedom, dignity. We believe that it was time to overcome to oil, the oil model that was so poisonous to my country. And of course, to rethink the ownership of the subsoil that has to be in the hands of citizens. Reduce the size of the state under the rule of law. And it was time to speak openly about the individuals as the center of society, along with their dreams and aspirations. And it was time to trust individuals for the first time in a long time, and of course, to trust in prosperity in entrepreneurship. And of course, we were the first political option that were talking about this while the other political parties were discussing about what kind of socialism is better. So yes, it was a good opportunity. I will do difference. So that dream today has the main national female opposition leader, that is Maria Corina Machado. We also have a small but vigorous parliamentary group, presence in all the states and almost all the municipalities in the country. And of course, we have clear aspirations to come to power once we achieve the transitions and we could have free elections. We are ready for running. And of course, to govern from the ideas of freedom. Um, and we have defined this like the perfect, the perfect storm. I don't, I don't know if you can read here, but the perfect storm is like, well, we have a pro-freedom and liberal national leader, our regional leaders, we have a fertile field for ideas of freedom, we have a growing young generation, because I have to say, yes, a lot, a lot of young people are leaving the country, but a lot of young people is remaining in the country. And they are fighting with us, and we are doing all our best in order to maintain them, you know, fighting and, and fighting for freedom, and this is important. Um, we have a solid political party, a defined, a clear political offer, and of course, we know that the transition in Venezuela is ahead, and we have the opportunity for having a historical break with socialism and the socialist ideas. So, uh, that dream has given me the opportunity to travel through all the country, training people in freedom ideas, and I have to say that today, the land is more fertile than never for, freedom, for ideas of freedom. It has been a challenge as exciting as, and it's beautiful 
to find how people say today my country no more socialism. Um, people embrace freedom and, and see freedom as a way of life and that's the best achievement of this fight can, can give you when you go through the country and find people that uh, tell you that they want freedom for their lives. So we have invested more than 5,000 hours in training people, not only um, you know, in political training. In a, we have formed a powerful network of, of replicators of these contents, of, of these ideas, and we have promoted an ideological debate because we know that it's time for ideas more than persons, ideas, ideas and institutions more than persons. Um, and yes, we are so glad of that. And of course, we have our main training project on liberty, that is Campus Libertad, where we train annually a group of leaders um, from all over the country in how to governance from a liberal perspective, a freedom perspective. So we train them with liberal ideas, with political communication, because it's not enough to know about liberalism. It's, it's important to how to spread this message and how to influence people through a communication. And of course, we train these people in ethics, because the main crisis that we have in Venezuela is an ethical crisis right now. And of course, we train them with public, in, public, in public policies with a reduced state vision. But yes, that's beautiful, that's our work. Um, I'm glad to be the leader of this team of training, etc. But we know that it's not enough. And we know that it's not enough because we are giving a double battle in this moment in my country. Once, one, against socialism, as you can see, um, what I show you, but also against the regime. This regime, this guy, can you see how he's, uh, the, their arm, um, the bracelet, you can see, um, and of course they call the opposition fascist, no? but you can see <laughs> the real fascism here. Um, the second challenge about the defeating this regime is, a, is even a greater challenge because we are talking about the defeat of a criminal regime. A regime that has no word and no honor, that mocks and kills. Understanding their nature, we know that only by breaking the mafias, because we know that we are a mafia state in my country, it's not that normal or simple dictatorship, it's a mafia state. Only by breaking the, the mafias will be possible to achieve the cessation of the usurpation that Maduro has in the power and of course move towards transi a transition that will lead us to free elections. Being Democrats, we know that democracy doesn't work with that kind of dreams because they are not politicians. They are criminals. Um, that is why we must press in all possible ways, individual sanctions, political sanctions, financial sanctions, diplomatic sanctions, all possible pressures. Because we are not facing a bad government. And I need to explain this. This is not an inefficient government that, you know, we just need to call for, OK, please govern in a good way, because we want to live better. Of course we want to live better, but this is not about government. It's the evil government. It's not about government. It's the evil government. And if you want to understand this and what we are facing, I want to show you this map. This map, this map only includes the influence of the Colombian guerrillas. Hi to my Colombian friends there. Um, this is the influence of the Colombian guerrillas over our territory. Okay? You can see, I think my pointer is not working, but okay, in the left side is Colombia, and we're, that is my country, and you can see how Around 70% of my territory or our territory is under control, direct or indirect, of these groups, criminal groups. And I'm not including here the Hezbollah camps and the Hamas camps that we have in Venezuela. I'm not including the drug trafficking in the coast, in the right side. So can you see what we are facing? It's a really 
dangerous mix of socialism, criminals, and of course, authoritarians. So that's the thing that we need to think about, about we are, we are facing because one of the debates that we, we are having internally in my country is that one of the problems of facing, uh, that is facing modern society is that the legitimacy has shifted. It seems that democracy is no longer, no longer legitimate for the defense of life, but for the fulfillment of the law. So even if the law or the regimes that promote and attack freedom, how we can defend democracy or, 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 or the democracy could be only into a defense of the fulfillment of the law and not in the defense of the life. And that's one of the biggest debates, the, the biggest debate that we are having right now. So that is why we have supported from the first day the interim government of Juan Guaido, who has assumed the temporary power as a result of the fraud and the shame elections that Maduro intended to seize the presidency in 2018. Um, and of course, uh, the main objective of Maduro is to remain the country in hands of mafias, and we understand this. So the important thing is that today, Juan Guaido is recognized or interim president by more than 50 countries. Um, we are in a stellar moment that requires our best efforts to achieve freedom through the path of courage urgently because we need the support of our Western allies. In the midst of conflict, as you can see here, Maria Corina with Guaido, uh, in the midst of conflict, every day that passes in my country is counted in death and suffering. I have no way of knowing how many Venezuelans will die today, but I know there will be many like every day. We must stop this drama and we must stop this tragedy as soon as possible. I have to say that Venezuela is a kidnapped country. It's a kidnapped country where we are all hostages and must be freed. Of course, we know that that liberation has to be led by the Venezuelans, and we know that driving towards freedom must be ours, but we cannot alone against uh, the darkest and the most anti-Western forces that are working in my country, as you could see in my presentation. Believe me, Venezuelans have given everything fighting for democracy using all the democratic tools and ways in order to reconquer freedom. But we realize that we are not facing politicians. We are facing criminals. I don't know if these years of efforts will have been worth it to the sacrifice of everything I have left behind even murder friends or friends in jail that I have in this moment. But I know that I'm doing the right thing. Because I am part of the generation who grew up for defending freedom without knowing before. Of course, when Chavez came to power, I was eight years old, so I never <laughs> know freedom or democracy. But I have to say that freedom is always victorious. Um, I put all my forces and my spirit in order to Venezuela won't be the section of this. We don't want more socialism, we don't want more populism, we don't want more corruption, and we don't want more misery. We are going to reconquer freedom and democracy, and I know that we will prevail on our purpose. Because there is a hope. There is a hope, believe me, we want, we want to be free, and while exists one Venezuelan fighting for freedom, there is a hope, and um, I know that we count on you, liberty, friends from all around the world, in our purpose to reconquer freedom, to be free again, to reconquer democracy, and of course, to understand that this regime that we are facing is opposed to the peace, is enemy of the peace, and we need, and we want to live in a peaceful country, but at the end we need all our freedom fighters, friends from all around the world, because we know that we will prevail. Thank you very much. Um, please feel free to follow me in Twitter, if you want. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. You have the video? Um, I, I think it's important maybe for understanding about what's happening with Juan Guaido, um, how was the process as he became uh, interim president of Venezuela. I want to show you a short video, five minutes video about, it's three months ago, it's not the most updated video, but it's important if you want to understand why Guaido is our interim president today and why we are uh, supporting him in our um, you know, request for freedom. So uh, let's see, okay, I don't know if we have. Okay. There is a lot of misinformation, so I did a bunch of research to explain in the clearest way possible what is going on in a way that I hope people can understand, because goddamn doesn't matter right now. Will this be funny? No, I am very much not in a funny mood. So let's begin with some important bullet points. One, what is happening in Venezuela is not a US-backed coup. Two, this is not a fight between the Venezuelan right wing and the Venezuelan left wing. This is a fight of the great majority of Venezuelans to democratically get rid of an illegitimate and punitive dictatorship. A dictatorship responsible for countless human rights abuses. Three, the people of Venezuela are seeking fair democratic elections using the laws written in our constitution. Four, Juan Guaido did not just declare himself president out of nowhere. That is not how it worked. So let's answer some questions. Who is the interim president Juan Guaido? Juan Guaido is not a right-wing politician, but the son of a taxi driver and a liberal representative in Congress. Guaido was elected by the Venezuelan people to be a representative in Venezuela's National Assembly. He is acting as interim president, as in temporary president, until democratic elections can be ensured, which is, by the way, dictated by law in the Constitution when a president is deemed illegitimate. In other words, this is not a coup. Next question. Why is President Nicolás Maduro illegitimate? Now this may take a little bit longer because there's a lot, but let's speed this thing up and start in 2017. In 2017, the Supreme Court that was handpicked by Nicolás Maduro's party nullified and stripped the National Assembly or Congress of their powers. The National Assembly was chosen by vote and was the only government institution that was run by an opposition majority. Imagine when the Democrats took the House, if Trump was like, no, I don't like this anymore. The House is no longer a legitimate part of government. And here's another House that I made up with everyone that agrees with me. Americans would be furious. So too are Venezuelans. Venezuela erupted in protests. Hundreds of protesters, most of them teenagers, were detained, some of whom were tortured and murdered. Meanwhile, despite these protests, Maduro made his own Congress that he could control, just like that. Fast forward to May 20th, 2018, where this illegitimate Congress calls for presidential elections. Now, during these elections, the most popular opposition candidates are either jailed, exiled, or banned from running. In other words, there is no legitimate way for the opposition to run. So these sham presidential elections are held anyway by Maduro's government, where only 20% of the population voted. However, a lot of the 20% were public employees who were intimidated into voting by threats from the government. These were called illegitimate elections, not just by the Venezuelan people, but by the international community. Everyone was on board saying, yeah, this shit's f***ed up, and if it's anything, it's definitely undemocratic. Now if you're wondering how the Venezuelan people truly feel about this, here are some statistics. According to recent polls, over 80% of Venezuelans disapprove of Maduro's government because there is a lot to disapprove of. Maduro took the minimum wage from $350 a month to $7 a month. Meanwhile, inflation hit 1.7 million percent in 2018, with the IMF projecting 10 million percent in 2019. So the daily minimum wage can't buy two eggs. According to UN projections, over 5 million people have left the country, causing a refugee crisis of Syrian proportions. That's more than 10 percent of the Venezuelan population. There is such a shortage of medical supplies that people are dying from previously eradicated diseases like polio because there aren't any vaccines. The economy is a disaster in a country that sits on the world's largest oil reserve. So where's all this money going? People in Maduro's government. Venezuela is the top 10 most corrupt country in the world, according to the Corruptions Perception Index. The media in Venezuela who should be reporting on this shit is censored and dissidents are jailed. Over 5,000 people since 2014 have been detained for speaking out against the government. And just since last week, when Guaido was elected, 791 people have been jailed. 
So what is happening now? Interim President Juan Guaido has been backed by the international community. Yes, this includes the United States, but do you know who else backs Juan Guaido that isn't Trump? Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Germany, the Socialist Party that runs Albania, Canada's progressive prince, Justin Trudeau, Australia, Paraguay, Peru, the government run by the Socialist Party of Spain, whose president said what is going on in Venezuela is the opposite of socialism. The list goes on. So that was a lot of information. And I am exhausted. And I'm not exhausted because I had to explain this to you, but I'm exhausted because the situation in Venezuela has been talked about in the forms of political ideologies and politicians and uh, political leanings. And it's, it's, the conversation has completely strayed away from what actually matters, which is the Venezuelan people. On a personal level, my immediate family, my father is exiled from back home. My extended family, they go out on these protests. My uncle is in jail for being a journalist that tried to shed light on what was going on. My cousin had to leave Venezuela because they were after him as well. This has affected everybody on a human level. And it doesn't matter what leanings you have in an ideological political standpoint. This is about people. This is about people wanting their country back. That's it. And if you have any more questions, ask a Venezuelan. And they can tell you from their personal human level how it's affected them. Please listen. Thank you, Pedro. And we have a, a question and answer time. And if you have some questions, raise your hand. Yep. Okay, first. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that really delightful presentation. I, I want to just say that, you know, for libertarians from the United States or from the, the democratic world, uh, activism is easy for us because we get to go home at night with security of knowing we keep our jobs and we're not going to end up in jail, but you guys are risking more than we'll ever risk and sacrificing more than we'll ever sacrifice. And you guys have my, my respect and admiration for the tremendous way in which you're risking so much for something that means so much. So thank you. And, thank and you. God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the support and for being with us. Thank you. So my, my question for you is, What's the way forward? I wonder if you could tell us what's the realistic way forward that the regime can be displaced, especially, uh, and, 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 what can, and what can any of us do to help in that, that effort? Great, thank you. Thank you for your question because I think it's a question that all Venezuelans <laughs> um, are asking uh, every day about uh, what's the forward, or what's forward, and what's the next step. But, we have heard in the recent days and recent weeks that all the options are on the table. That's uh, like a mantra in, in a lot of places, even in the United States, uh, they're talking about, yes, all the options are on the table. But the thing is that we have had in Venezuela eight, eight or nine uh, failed um, attempts to dialogue between opposition and the regime. And it, was be, it, it has been useful just for giving time to Maduro. So the thing is that dialogue or you know, conversations between opposition and the regime are not possible at this moment, at least that that negotiations could go through, you know, define how the regime will leave power, but not to remain. So I think that all the, all the options are not on the table at this moment. Um, if we understand that we are facing a criminal regime, we need to understand that we need to force them to negotiate, uh, to negotiate uh, their exit of power. And that's only possible through force, the use of force. But I have to say here that it's not about intervention. Because when people talk about military intervention, I don't like to talk about intervention because I think that that has been the narrative of leftists taking advantage of the mistakes of the past of countries like the United States in order to talk about, yes, we, you want a war, uh, you want to uh, uh, kill people, innocent people, but let's wait because, yes, maybe some people want to avoid to kill people through a conflict or whatever, but while the time is passing, 
Maduro is killing people by hunger and, and by misery. So that I think that's that cannot be the argument about discussing through force or the using of force. I think the use of force of our neighbors or United States it has to be in order to press the regime, but not for an invasion. The real invasion we are having in Venezuela right now with Russians, with Cubans, with Iranians, that's a real invasion that we have. It's a silent invasion that we are having in the country. And people don't talk about this, but the real thing is that we need to understand that we are facing criminals and we need to deal with these criminals in the way to defeat them, defeat them and that way through the use of force, legitimate um, force, but at the, at the same time understand that the international community has a responsibility with people, with populations. And we can talk about the United Nations with their responsibility to protect, it could be. But at the end, we need to understand that we are talking about people suffering. And if we defend life and we defend the promotion of life, we need to, you know, stand with these people that are fighting for his freedom. And as I, as I told he, here, we are a kidnapped country. It's not a common dictatorship, it's not a common you know, authoritarian regime. They are really bad guys. And they need, we need a uh, you know, trust uh, uh, threat in order to they understand that it's better to live than to remain in power. That's my, my personal vision of this. But every day that passes, you can see how peacefully options are peaceful options are you know are going because this regime cannot go in through a pacific way and that's it that's it the real thing yep next so thank you very much i yep. have had an impression that uh, you showed the pictures from 30 years ago from poland it was the same situation i hope that the transition will be uh, as well you will uh, you will have this transition as we did and it will not be very costly because in Poland the transition costed only 30 uh, human lives. I have two questions, very short one. Uh, who was the girl uh, from the movie? Was it the leader of, uh, of your party? No, she is an influencer, a YouTuber. She is a daughter of a, a really famous economist in my country that lives in the United okay, States. Okay, enough, Ika. Yeah. And the second question, could you send me the um, link to this uh, movie? Of course. I will let translate immediately to Poland and publish in of Poland. Of course, it's I can very share the link with writing. all of you. Okay, yeah, of course. okay. thank Perfect. you Thank you. I will do it. Do you think other South American countries are going to learn from this? Uh, do you think this will drive other South American countries more toward free markets, or, or, or will it have no impact on them at all? Well, I hope so. I hope they learn from the Venezuelan experience. But when you see what's happening in countries like Colombia, or Argentina, or even in Mexico, uh, we need to be really, you know, aware of that. At the end, these ideas, bad ideas, are always a possibility, and that's the truth. So, so yes, you can see how countries like Chile, like Peru, are growing. They have good standards, in, you know, free markets, etc. But at the at the end, populism and, and and socialism are really alive in our hemisphere. And for that reason I say that freedom and liberty is a you know everyday task, not only through politicians but also through you know NGOs, foundations, uh, freedom fighters, because we need to understand that uh, I have to say that Venezuela is like the, the worst example to show what socialism could could you know could cause in a country. We, we are the, the example of what not to do in a country, unfortunately, but I hope that our lesson and, and our experience could be useful for all the region. I hope so. So, uh, last question. Okay, thank you. So I heard you say the time for dialogue is passing and the time for force is at hand. Is there any evidence that there's any guerrilla warfare activity going on in Venezuela against the regime? So can you repeat the last part, please? Is there any evidence that there is guerrilla warfare going on against the regime? Because that would be the best way to start toppling the government. Can you please repeat all the questions, please? The first one is... That, the guerrillas, okay, yeah, well... Come. No, I... I, I I mean, uh, when you see these criminal forces in the country, 
not only gorillas, because the gorillas are in certain parts of the, as you see, in the territory, but at least in the city, in the city we have collectivos that are like paramilitary groups that we have, that the, the, regime, the regime pay them in order to defend revolution. And of course, that's a way to, they show that they, ha they have power. And of course, they use this in order to say, okay, we want to dialogue, we want to go to the position through a table of negotiation and let's try to talk, to speak about, but at the end, these people are killing, are killing other innocent people in the streets, or they are kidnapping children in the, in the border zone in the country. So at the end, this regime has no vocation of dialogue because they know that they are criminals, not politicians. And that's my... my, my, my No, we don't have, of course, of course we don't have, um, we don't have for... But if you're called for force, that would be your first step, and you should have. It could be, but the thing is that, the, uh, because I want, I want to clarify this, another uh, fear about the use of force in my country is, you know, it's like a civil war could happen, and that's not possible in my country. And not possible because we are not a divided society, into, you know, 50-50, like, okay, the, the half of the population wants Maduro and the half of the population um, don't, don't want Maduro. Or um, we don't have religious conflict, we don't have ideological country. So sometimes people say that it's the use of force it could be, you know, dangerous because it could be a civil war, and that's not possible. At the end, it's a war against civilians, but not it's a civil war, as it's a small group that, that have the guns with guerrillas and all this group against the 90% of the population. Um, so yes, we need to understand, to understand that, but um, many groups are thinking that a solution could be that. Like, okay, if they have guerrillas, we need to have our own guerrillas, but the thing is that we are, um, we are a people that we don't have guns, and that's, that's the thing. And for that reason, we are claiming for external support on this, because we cannot alone. And understand it that we are facing this this regime, no? Okay, thank you, Pedro. Thank you very much. Richard, too. Muchas gracias, amigo.